So let's talk about the real Stoglav. I found an experience report of a Stuck Brigade from 1944, particularly about summer, fall 1944, in the northern part of the Eastern Front. And it was published in November 1944. So basically when the war was pretty much at a very dire state for Germany. Now a Stuck Brigade, what does this mean? Well, it's about 30 Stucks and 15 Assault Heutzers. So basically the Stuck with, with a, equipped with a Howitzer, not with a regular gun. So, first of it starts with notes on the Soviet training. Of course, they call them Russians because, well, German wartime documents. And then it goes on with experience in various tactics, cooperation with the infantry, with the artillery and general problems. Now, first off, they talk about the Soviet fighting style and training, Kampfweise und Ausbildungsstand. And what they note, for instance, the Soviet infantry is generally badly trained. But in certain instances, especially if they're dug in, they are very tough and hard. They fight till the end. So they can't be dislodged easily if they're dug in well. And so it really depends on the fortification situation. And this also means that you need infantry support for the storks if you attack such a position. Then they also point out that the Soviets sometimes have very well educated, specialized anti-tank infantry. And the particular note, these are very dangerous and there it's paramount that the Stuks cover each other all the time. So they are a problem. Then they talk about anti-tank guns. So, and they note that especially the heavy anti-tank guns got way more now in the, in, the late, in the last years of the war. And they usually put them in situations that they're both layered and also overlapping. So that they have overlapping fuse of fire. And now they talk about the tactics they use as well. So basically they use layered and ambushes and the mass of the guns only takes an effective range. So for light anti-tank guns, it's about 400 meters and for heavy anti-tank guns, 800 meters. But they have a few teasing guns, they call them lockende Geschütze. And these sometimes are single guns or sometimes batteries that open fire very early on. So up to three kilometers. So they open fire and then you go to engage them and then you drive basically into an ambush. Additionally note that the Soviets very often used the anti-tank guns also against infantry, which was rather untypical for the Germans. And they also note the increase in heavy anti-tank guns is likely due to the change in the organization. For instance, that the infantry division, the rifle divisions were upgraded with 76.2 millimeter guns and similarly the, the regiments as well. Now then they talk about how the Soviets react to, to Sturks at the front line. And usually they note they are quickly recognized and then they try to circumvent them. So basically if the Sturks do an attack or a counterattack, they try to outmaneuver them. And this also leads to the recommendation that Sturks should never be at the main line of resistance for too long at the Hackhell, the Hauptkampflinie. Because what the Soviets usually do, if they see their Stuks there, they send weak forces to bind them and then to do the main attack somewhere else. So basically to outflank them. And the recommendation here is to keep the Stuks as a central reserve so that they can counter attack or can be brought in at critical points or situations. Now, then they talk about Soviet tanks and they note all of them can be still be killed with the Stuk. Although the note for the Stalin Panzer, they don't specify which one, one took about 17 shots to get to put, be put out of action. Additionally, note on the equipment that many of the tanks are equipped with modern US radios. And then they talk about American tanks. They note M2, M3, and Sherman. And they note they have a better cross country capability than the Sturk. And their optics and radios are far better than those of the Soviet tanks. But then they point out, due to a lack of training for the Soviet side, that they barely can bring these benefits to work at the front line. They then go on and talk about the motivation of the Soviet tank crews. And it's very interesting because, because they point out it's very different. So often the Soviets fight till the last tank. But in some cases they encounter, they assume, badly trained tankers and they they just, after the first few shots, they just leave. So they note one instance or even two where they captured about 20 tanks that were completely intact. 
So very interesting that sometimes they refight till the last thing and sometimes, okay, they just run. Although they know more often than not they fight to the last tank. And but what they know generally that the Soviets try to avoid tank to tank versus tank combat. So they drive in a re reserve slow position or, or go in more in an ambush. Then they also point out that usually the tanks, if they are left, they're booby trapped. So radio and equipment, they're usually booby traps on it and they had some losses from that. So that one should be careful if they go into a tank. Then they talk about what the Soviets sometimes do is firing on suspicion. So that they just fire even they don't know where the enemy is. And they know this has a very important effect on the morale of their own infantry. So the German infantry is then usually a bit scared. Then they talk about Soviet artillery and they note, okay, we take significant losses from massed artillery fire. And then they point out, this is, this we should take in for our artillery, because this means that mass artillery against tanks always or nearly always works. So they speak specifically attack, concentration of tanks, when they assemble before the attack and everything else. And they also point out that if anything is immobilized, the sugar or something, they will fire upon it. Like as pointed out in my video about the Soviet defenses at Kursk. Now come the tactical experiences and these are three parts. Basically first is cooperation with the infantry and they point out they finally convinced the infantry commanders that batteries of Sturks are better than single Sturks. So this was for a long time the problem that the infantry was, okay, I just send in one Sturk. And, and, and generally you see this in, in the regulations for the Panzerwaffe and everywhere else. They always say, at least lose, use a platoon or a battery. A battery would be a company here. So not single, single vehicles. Then they know that in general there's a good cooperation now going on, there's a basic understanding. But sometimes there's an important lack of details. For instance, specific information on the enemy, on the, on the HKL, the main line of resistance, where there are good trails to drive and everything else. And they point out this is especially important because the Stuks now, we are at the end of the war, they sometimes they come in, they march in and they immediately put into action. So they, have, they have to shift from march to combat immediately. So they don't know where they're going to see action. So every piece of information is very important. And they also point out that the problem is that the infantry that accompanies the Sturks is often not engaging the enemy. So they know there's often enemies out there that could be easily engaged with small arms fire, but their infantry leaves it to the Sturks. So very important their munition is wasted or the priority of targets is shifted. And they talk about mounted infantry and that they often get off too late. In general, it's better to dismount early than too late. Another issue with the infantry is you have the problem. You don't want to have your infantry sticking to your Sturg or tank. But at the same time, you don't want, want the infantry trailing far behind because then the infantry needs to protect the Sturg. But if they are too close, they, since the, the Stuks usually attract a lot of fire, you have a lot of casualties basically from collateral damage in this case. Another major problem denoted with infantry commanders is that they sometimes put the Stuk right out in the open and it attracts, of course, a lot of fire. And while well, this is detrimental to the Stuk and everything and also for the infantry later on. So, and that they should give more leeway and allow the Stuk to get in an ambush position. Generally, this, this report was written rather, well, it's, it's rather positive if you look at that's published in November 1944. But there's one point which will come now where you can clearly see basically the desperation going on. They note that sometimes staff, staff units and also supply train units, infantry, is used for, for counterattacks with the Storks. So basically the rear guard units, the, the units that shouldn't see action. We don't talk about combat units or combat support units. We're talking about supply and staff units. So you see the, the last scraping the barrel. And they note, we should educate them what a Stuck can do and not. Because due to the limited knowledge on, 
on the Sturm, Sturm artillery, they have unnecessary losses. So please train them on what a Sturmgeschütz can do and can't do. And this is, you can see, okay, you, you train now the, the cook basically on what a Stuck can do or can't do or a staff officer because these are the last, these are the men you sometimes send into combat with, with one of your best units because nobody else is left. So this is basically the, the most prevalent part where you can see, okay, the war is really going bad and there's no way of denying it. Now the next recommendation they have is that there should be a bridge and trail status map. So that each division has several and also copies to give away because due to the regular redeployment of the Sturks to, to certain areas in the front where they need it most, they need a quick orientation. And the problem is they need information on which trails they can use, which bridges they, they can use or can't use. Additionally, they require that every bridge has an information on the capacity on there. And if it's basically, and, and then also noted, if it can't be used, where to bypass for tracked vehicles. So this will save time for the Sturks because they don't need, or the, the, basically the crew, because they don't need to do recon themselves or something. Another problem they have that they are often called in when they are not really needed. So that sometimes the infantry needs to fight without the Sturm artillery because the situation doesn't require it. Because if the Sturks are called often in, they, they move around, wear and tear, there's limited fuel, limited spare parts, and also at the same time they are delayed. So if there's a real break in at a certain point in the front and then they are needed there, they are now somewhere else and they can't be immediately redeployed. So they say, okay, just call us in when you really need us, because some people seem to be not really doing this properly. Now, the second major point is the cooperation with the artillery. Generally point out the cooperation is good, but that the personal connection between the individual commanders is very important. And this is a proper radio setup for the units. Then they talk about the simple target designation. So use um, location names, for instance, like they talk about the Packwäckchen, the anti-tank forest or small forest, and also the map with target locations and grid maps and everything else. But what to point out, very important, the map must be usable within the Sturk and you need a proper map that both units, both the artillery and the Sturks can use. Then they also point out, okay, no forward observers are needed because this is done by the crew of the Sturk. And there's the reminder, for, don't forget guys, Sturm artillery is part of the artillery. We know what we are doing, usually. There are some differences, but usually they are part of this. Now, the third major part is general remarks about the principles. So they talk about the organization first and they know, okay, best thing is to have a battery with seven Sturks and three assault hearts, so the Stus. And also generally the number of 45 is good and the, the relationship should be three to one of these. And they particularly point out that a platoon with the assault hearts alone doesn't really work and that they use these better and they distribute them among the regular Sturks. So they put in the assault hearts there because normally you have to engage both the, uh, armor targets, which are good for the Sturks and more or less soft targets for which the assault hearts is particularly useful. Then they also point out recon by foot. It's very important and should be done at every possibility and also during the mission if this is required. And they also note this might be unpleasant, but the benefit trumps the drawbacks. It's specifically pointed out there. Now they finally also talk about night operations and they say, okay, do recon by day if possible. And you always need an infantry for close support. And specifically they point out one squad of engineers or regular infantry for close support to, to prevent any attacks on the tank, tanks during the night. And if there are mines in the area, there are a lot of mines in the area, don't attack at night. They specifically say no night operations if the, the area is mine infested or something. 
Then they also point out some minor stuff like use red flares for the infantry for target designation, not white flares. Because for, for one reason, I don't know specifically why, the white flare seems to illuminate the Stucks more and there's a problem there, so red flares are better in this case. They also add something on firing on suspicion as we had for the Soviets and they point out during the night firing on suspicion is good because it enforces the morale of the own infantry and usually brings down the morale of the enemy. So that it should be done more often and also denote the infantry should do it as well because this also sometimes gives away the perception that there are more units or more troops with them than actually are. So a bit of, of deception going on. Now then they talk about that the Stuks should be not dispersed around the front lines. They should be used as a fast moving reserve. Especially since the enemy has many tanks. Now they specifically note a single Stuck can rack up several kills, but usually the enemy will then circumvent it and it will break through. Whereas if there's a full defense going on, so a Stuck battery or something or a larger unit, they will destroy most of the enemy and then they can be used to be redeployed or used in a counter-attack. You can't use a single Stuck in a counter-attack. This is very interesting because um, Wilbeck, who wrote his master thesis on the effective use of Tigers, which I covered in this video, points out that the Tigers actually in defense worked better in dispersed fashion. Now, I'm not entirely sure, but I think Wilbeck was speaking mostly about the Italian front which is quite different from the whole setup because it's rather small, especially compared to the Eastern Front. And he also noted, okay, for the, for the Tiger it was this because it has a more psychological effect and also it's a heavy tank, it's more resistant. So, and, and of course the wear and tear is far higher on the Tiger for moving it around than for a Stuck. So still not entirely sure how to look at this, because I, I probably need to read what Wilbeck wrote there and I think he was mainly referring to the Italian front so and also maybe get some important information from some experts like Ralf Ratz or Chifton here. Now then there's a final very interesting point which I think could be related to, to the issue with Guderian which I talked about uh, once they note the problem with the cooperation with the Panzerjägers with the anti-tank or with the tank hunters, with the commanders. Because if the brigade is attached to a division, there's sometimes this problem that the, the Panzerjäger commander is used as the advisor for the division and not the Stuck commander. And they point out specifically, no, it's the Stuck commander, not the Panzerjäger commander. So what had happened is, Original Stucks were all part of the, of the Sturm artillery, Storm or Assault artillery. But at one point when Guderian became the Generalinspector of the Panzertruppen, the Chief Inspector of the Panzertruppen, he wanted to grab the Stucks as well. And I think at one point they say, okay, we give you now a certain amount of the monthly production you can have for your anti-tank units or for your tank units. Specifically, that is quite interesting because in the original paper, Guderian had written in the Sturm, uh, the Sturmgeschütze in there, but somebody redacted it to only the heavy ones, so the Ferdinand, and uh, it was quite, quite a gravel going on in there, but it's on the side. So this could be, I'm not entirely sure, ask somebody who's more knowledgeable and he also would say, yeah, we don't really know. So it's likely in relation to that, that there's some discrepancy going on. Now, a final note here, they also noted that there's some issues with onboard radio and that the replacements need better training in the onboard radio, which I found quite interesting because as you can see, there's a lot of channel information and stuff. And then there are also very minor details where I think, is this really important? But particularly if they wrote it in there, I think it's an H page report if I remember correctly. In 1944, it probably was very important. So important note here, I revived my Instagram account. So I will be posting their regular pictures from not only books, but a lot of from museum visits over the years, which I never posted out there. So be sure to, to subscribe there or follow me or whatever you do on, on Instagram. And yeah.
Big thank you to all my supporters. Thank you for watching and see you next time.